You're listening to All Things Video, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the past and charting the future of the online video ecosystem. You're listening to All Things Video. I'm your host, James Creech, and today's guest is Jason Falls, Director of Digital and Social Strategy at Cornette. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, James. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. You know, I was I want to start off, I say normally on this show, we travel back in time. I want to hear all about, you know, the guest background and career trajectory, which we'll get to with you. But I, I thought, you know, it might be more appropriate in this case to talk about how we met, right? Because we connected through the power of the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's isn't that the the case these days with most people, especially now that COVID's, uh, you know, this is how we network. But yeah, exactly. you and I've been connected for a while, and it's it's the social media world. That's right. And I recently read a terrific article you wrote. Uh, you published it in Entrepreneur about the H- HBO documentary Fake Famous, mm-hmm. and then I immediately was late at night. I was like, I've got to learn more about this. I saw you at a podcast with the director. Uh, Nick Bilton about the film. So I listened to that. And then I hit you up and I said, Jason, I just had all the same thoughts when watching this movie. I have to talk to you about it. So I'm curious, for those who aren't familiar, maybe just give a little bit of background on the film and then your response to it. Sure. So Fake Famous is a documentary on HBO. Nick Bilton, the former technology writer for the New York Times and currently a contributor to Vanity Fair, wrote, produced, and directed the film. And basically, it's a a kind of a social experiment where he takes three people who don't have big online followings, like less than 1,200 people are are connected to these three people online. And he basically tries to uh, make them fake famous. So he buys followers, he buys engagement using bots and whatnot, basically fraudulently building up these, uh, these three individual profiles. Now, two of the three in the course of the documentary back out. One of them doesn't want anything to do with all the fake stuff. The other one, his friends start calling him out on it. So he backs away. And that leaves Dominique Druckmann, who is uh, is a young lady who was like, yeah, I'm all in. Let's do it. Why not? This is a test. Let's figure it out. Well, Bilton eventually during the course of the film gets her up to 250,000 followers and brands start offering her free products. A fashion brand takes her on a trip to Vegas. So there's she becomes an influencer and most, if not all of her audience is fake. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, which that's an interesting experiment. I was, you know, the movie is well done. It's well written and all that good stuff. But the, the, the problem I really had with it was, is that Bilton tries to basically say, this is how all influencers build their audiences. It's all fake. It's all people who want to be famous. There's no substance to their content. Um, it's all contrived. And of course, I work at an ad agency and we work with, you know, influential content creators every day who have a great deal of, of acumen and ability to move the needle for our clients. So I know that all is not applicable here. And so that's where I sort of, you know, drew a line in the sand and said, no, 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 you don't get to do that. So let's come on the podcast and let's talk about it. I wrote a piece for Entrepreneur where I kind of, you know, underlined the point. And there's lots of little things I can nitpick about the film that bother the crap out of me. But, <laughs> uh, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. It's the all or nothing mentality that I had a problem with. The experiment was actually very interesting. And it was mm-hmm. interesting to see how he did it and, and how some influencers do build. Uh, their audience, but he's claiming it's all, I think it's about 10, 15%. Yeah. Yeah. I I shared many of the same critiques, right. That he focuses specifically on one platform, Instagram, right. On one kind of narrow vertical, which is kind of this fashion and beauty lifestyle, you know, what we would think of as the, the vapid, you know, vlogger personality type, which is not necessarily reflective of all vloggers, but you know, it's, it's kind of they're pigeonholed or, or stereotyped in this film. And um, he doesn't, you know, attempt to seek the best practices of, you know, an expert marketer like yourself. He doesn't talk to brands about, you know, hey, why are you doing influencer marketing? Has it worked for you, right? Why do people continue to come back and and spend more, do these long-term ambassador programs with influencers? Clearly, they must be working or, you know, this whole industry uh, wouldn't look the way it does today. That's right. And one of the other things that he does in the film is he, he uses one of the uh, influencer marketing software tools, which a lot of them now have the ability for you to drop in the URL or the account handle of, of an Instagrammer, let's say. And it'll tell you with some degree of confidence how this tool thinks, whether or not this, this uh, influencer's audience is fake or not. And he, it's ironic because in the film, he uses Hype Auditor. He do, it doesn't display Hype Auditor in the film, but if you know anything about the interface, you know it's Hype Auditor. 
and he and runs they've, Dominic. They've also done a rebuttal, right? They've they've exactly. come out since the film and said, "Hey, this is what he got wrong, even about our platform." Yep. Exactly. The thing about the film that's really ironic and funny is he puts Dominic Druckmann in there, and it says that you know and he reports in the film that it says she has real followers, which it doesn't say that. And he says in the film that she is of the 1% of the most famous people in the world. So he positions it to prove his point. But if you actually look at the screen capture from the movie, there's two little red buttons and the two little red buttons say, this person's audience may be fraudulent. You might want to dig into this a little deeper. So Hype Auditor actually worked. He just reported that it didn't. <laughs> exactly. And, and Hype Auditor, you know, uses... A variety of public signals, right? They're scraping a bunch of publicly available data from Instagram and other platforms and using that to build models to inform, estimate, right? If there are irregularities in the data, hey, we saw a sharp increase in followers, it's unexpected, you know, make sure to dig into that and, and maybe you can justify it. And in other cases, maybe you can't, you know, or hey, we've noticed, you know, these accounts, which might be on a blacklist, are frequently commenting on you know, multiple influencers posts, it's not very substantive, maybe they're posting in multiple languages, you know, not showing real user behavior, they can kind of identify what some of those improper signals might be. Yeah, right. Hype Auditor does a nice job, of, but they they will tell you this, and I will tell you this too, those tools that it indicated an, a, a, an influencer's follower, followers might not be, you know, altogether, you know, salient and real are just indicators. They're just points in the right direction. You still have to roll up your sleeves and do the work to look at the content, look at the comments, look at the engagement, look at the audience to understand whether or not that influencer is good for you. They're, those are just high level points. They're not to be considered chapter and verse. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, you know, one of the big things that we encourage our customers to do at Paladin is, authorize the influencer's data, right? Get the, the first party data access from the Instagram, you know, and Facebook Graph API, grab it from YouTube, um, you know, other platforms where you can then have real time transparency into who's the audience that's watching this content. Is it the type of audience that I'm looking to target? And then are we seeing the results that we would expect as a brand? Exactly. Very good. So, you know, let's, let's travel back in time a little bit now and, and tell me how did you get your start in digital media and influencer marketing in the first place? Okay, so um, it, it's it's really um, I've considered myself, or as I look back on it now, because we never we didn't use the term influencer marketing until about five or six years ago. Prior sure. to that, it was blogger outreach or whatever. But um, but I've been a PR guy my whole professional career. So public relations is really influence marketing in my mind because you're you know reaching out to audiences via third parties, and and PR is media relations. So you reach out to them through magazines, and newspapers, and radio and television. And so I've been, you know, pitching media members on story ideas for, you know, 30 years now, and I've been doing that my whole life. So influence marketing uh, to me is really just an extension of that. The media landscape has changed because of social media. It's different. Uh, you've got uh, democratization of the media that's happened and everybody can now be a publisher. Unfortunately, everybody's trying to be a publisher and some people <laughs> shouldn't be. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, the signal that rises from the noise happens to be influencers these days. And so, um, you know, I've, I've been doing this, you know, basically since I got out of school, I was originally, I originally went to college because I wanted to be an anchor on ESPN. Um, and I worked in sports talk radio for a couple of years in broadcast journalism. Uh, but then, you know, got into athletics PR for about 15 years. So I watch ball games for a living, not a hard job. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't pay well, but it's not a hard job. Sure. Um, and then it, uh, when my son was born, I decided I was traveling too much and I needed to get out into a more mainstream marketing PR thing. Mm -hmm. So I landed a job as a PR account manager at Doe Anderson, which is a, an ad agency in Louisville, Kentucky. And, and they work with, um, I was primarily hired to work with Louisville Slugger at the time. Um, because I had the sports background, but they also work with Maker's Mark and, and uh, Bourbon and a couple of other um, regulated industry brands. And so I started, you know, throwing out ideas about blogs and social media and, and things like that. And the clients were just like, hey, we, we don't know what any of that stuff is, but let's figure something out. And so I got to start throwing ideas out at Maker's Mark. We launched the first blog in the spirits industry. Um, you know, we came up with some really cool ideas for the Maker's Mark ambassador program that had to deal with social media. And so because I was working in regulated industries, I started getting invited to speak at conferences and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I became, I guess, known a little bit in the social media world. Uh, my blog at the time, Social Media Explorer, started to gain some traction, eventually became, you know, fairly well known in the social media marketing space. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, I wrote a couple books and, you know, did the speaking circuit thing. And um, so I've kind of been in and out of the agency consulting world for the last 15 years doing this. And I've been at Cornette now a little bit over three years. 
and um, just started cranking out some influence marketing stuff that was really smart. And that coincided with a lot of frustration with the mainstream media painting influencers into a corner mm -hmm. and a combination of those things kind of came together and, and the book kind of came out of that. Very good. Well, excited to talk a little bit more about the book, but you know, to, to put us in time here, you know, your, your early experience in Joe Anderson, this was 2006 to 2009, right? Kind of mm -hmm. in that time yep. frame. So, yep. I mean, your YouTube has just launched and then gotten acquired by Google. You've got Facebook kind of emerging on the scene, but still kind of confined to college campuses <laughs> and then starts to, to take off. So, you know, you're talking about blogging, which obviously was an important precursor to a lot of this. And then early sites like, you know, MySpace and then of course, Facebook and, and, and others. Um, what was the reception from brands when you tried to encourage them, you know, hey, not only is the internet still relatively new, but social media is this, this brand new phenomenon. How did you encourage them to think about, you know, starting with something totally, totally new? Well, you know, I started out with blogs because uh, back then it was like, look, this is content that goes on your website, which is going to help you with search. And so when you're showing them a business, a path to a business goal or a business objective, now all of a sudden they perk up and start paying attention. Um, and as Twitter, you know, started to become more relevant and more popular, um, you know, Facebook was still sort of mostly college kids, but then it kind of opened up and started to explode pretty quickly. So, you know, through 2007, eight, nine, around in there, um, brands were asking a lot of questions, but weren't ready to put budget behind it. But then as I was able to illustrate, Hey, if you do this, then you are solving this, you know, problem for Maker's Mark. You know, when I recommended the first blog in the spirits industry, it was let's give Bill Samuels Jr. the at the time the CEO of Maker's Mark a more direct, intimate connection with the Maker's Mark ambassadors, which is a very important sort of customer ambassador group for them. And that communication, that internal communication, customer retention, uh, sort of effort was how we positioned that, and 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 so that was successful. Um, when I started working, I did some consulting work after I left O. Anderson with Humana. And um, one of the things that I helped build for them, the healthcare company was Twitter customer service mm -hmm. and sort of, again, solving a business need. It wasn't about, you know, Twitter and blogs and Facebook. It was about customer attention, customer acquisition, customer service. So and this I'm is talking where your in, customers are. So this is where you need exactly. to be. Exactly. Yep. Talking in business terms makes them pay attention and nod and smile and say, okay, that makes sense to, to us little harder back then and still some somewhat of a challenge today, although it's a lot easier today to say, here's how that leads to revenue. Here's how mm. we can drive sales through these channels. But I was constantly trying to figure that piece out too. And I think having that sort of strategic approach mm. has always helped me be able to create things for clients where they, they put some, some money behind it. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, this is even harder to do in heavily regulated industries, healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Obviously working with a spirits brand where you have to, you know, do the legal drinking age compliance. So a certain percentage <laughs> of the audience has to be 21 plus, right? So how are you navigating some of those regulatory challenges in the midst of exploring these new platforms? It was tough. I mean, for, for a while there, I was getting monthly reports, um, you know, through Beam Global Spirits and Wine, which, you know, owned Maker's Mark. I was also work, doing some work with Jim Beam and a couple of those other brands. Um, but I was getting monthly reports on the demographic makeup of certain social networks because, you know, there were some that we just couldn't play on. Um, you know, Facebook was not uh, the, the Distilled Spirits Council of the U.S. is kind of the regulatory body for the spirits industry. And their standards were 70 percent of the audience has to be at least has to be 21 and over mm -hmm. for you to be able to even advertise there. And it was more of an advertising regulation because they didn't know what social media was. Um, and so 70%, well, Facebook wasn't 70% 21 and over, uh, probably until, you know, a year or two after it, you know, came out of the college only phase. Um, Twitter was, uh, uh, you know, pretty good for the most part. But then when you got into, you know, other platforms, um, you know, like Snapchat for the longest time, there was no way you could play on there because it was mostly a younger demographic. So for the longest time, it was, we can't play there yet. Now we were constantly thinking of ideas because we knew one day we would be able to play there. Because as the older generation started to, you know, see what was happening and get and adopt those tools, the demographics caught up with us. Um, but it was tough. You know, we, when, when Snapchat became big, we, I did have one client in the spirits industry who was really excited about doing stuff on Snapchat. And I was just like, nope, can't touch it. You know, we just can't go there because at the time, I think it was something like 50 or 60% of their audience was under mm -hmm. 21. And like that, we, we just can't play there. The good thing is, is that the spirits industry, I've never met anyone in the spirits industry who doesn't agree that the regulations and the rules are there for a reason and we cannot violate them. It's just, we do not, we do not cross that line. And uh, fortunately, all you have to do is throw up that demographic and they immediately go, yep, you're right. We can't do it. Yep. Makes sense. 
And, and what I love about your background is you weren't just, you know, this wasn't theoretical for you. You were a practitioner, right? You launched yeah. the social examiner, uh, a social media explorer site, and you were uh, writing about your experience. You were, mm -hmm. you know, testing these theories in real time. So what were some of the early experiments that you conducted or what were some of the things that you were learning along that journey? You know, a lot of what I was doing, you got to remember, this is, you know, pre Instagram, this is pre Snapchat, as you mentioned, you know, YouTube was still really new, Facebook wasn't really open to uh, anybody other than college kids at the time. So you're talking about blogs and Twitter, for the most part, there was a lot of MySpace going on uh, back then still, it was still relevant for a while there. Uh, but they didn't really keep up with the time. So that was fading as well. So I was doing a lot of experimentation with blogs, um, you know, using, you know, the written content. And I actually started doing some video content too. When, when YouTube started to take off, I had a little thing called Social Media Explorer TV, uh, which is kind of a version of what I do now with some of the live stream stuff today, where I just interviewed, you know, notable people from around the space. Um, and so I was experimenting with, you know, how can you drive traffic? How can you route that traffic to a, a conversion point where you're getting this, them to sign up for an email newsletter? How can you get traffic to your website from Twitter and other social networks? How can you use your website to get, you know, drive more followers on those social networks? So we were constantly just kind of pushing buttons and experimenting and trying things to see what would work so that we could go back to our client and say, look, in this sample size over here, which is small and somewhat misleading because it's mostly marketing nerds, um, but we know this will work. And so if we apply it to a broader audience in a different vertical, we think it will. Mm -hmm. Some things did and some things didn't, but at the same, and for instance, a really good example, that blog for Maker's Mark, we actually ended up, because it was for ambassadors and it was very focused on this sort of customer retention, customer engagement thing, it was behind a, a signup. You had to be an ambassador to see it. So it wasn't even public. So we, we totally skipped out on the SEO, you know, uh, benefits of it. Mm. It was all about, no, this is a communications mechanism for the ambassador program. And that's what's for. Mm -hmm. So we were tweaking and playing with all sorts of different things there in, in, in the, uh, the early days just to see what worked. And, um, you know, fortunately we found a few things that did. Very good. And you touched on throughout your history, you've kind of flipped back and forth between being in house at these big agencies, PR digital agencies, and then also kind of doing your own thing. So I'm curious you know, what does that path look like? Have you always considered yourself entrepreneurial and, and how do you decide when to go your own way and when to join forces with a larger group? Yeah, I'm probably a bad example because I'm really, really good at doing my job when I don't have to worry about running the business. So, you know, working for myself is a problem because I don't want to deal with accountants and budgets and payrolls and stuff. <laughs> I want to, I want to create, man, you know, I want to create content and I want to create strategies. So, um, you know, when I left O Anderson, um, you know, I felt like it was time to go out on my own. I was, I really wanted to focus on doing social media strategy and Doe was a, an ad agency that was full service. I was actually leading the interactive team. So we were building websites and doing SEO and a lot of other things. And I was really just thought the opportunity is ripe for me to go do this one thing and capitalize on that. And so that was kind of behind my decision to leave Doe. You know, fast forward a few years later and Cafe Press, you know, a big online retailer came to me and said, we have some very specific problems we think you can help us solve. And so I sold Social Media Explorer, the, which I built a small agency at that point, was working mm -hmm. for myself. I had a business partner, Nicole Kelly. I sold the business to her and went to a, you know, big publicly traded online retailer uh, for a few years to help them solve some problems. And um, that was an interesting opportunity for me. I consider it my master's degree in e-commerce because I hadn't really worked in e-commerce situations until then. And I had a really good run there. And then I came back to the agency side of things um, just because I think that's where I'm most comfortable. Um, I would love to you know, run all things digital for a brand. That'd be fantastic. Um, and I've looked for some of, those, some of those opportunities over the years, but I'm really happier in an agency setting where A, I don't have to run the business, which is important to me. Um, so I can have healthcare and a salary and all that kind of stuff. I'm not that entrepreneurial. <laughs> um, and B, I, I have a variety of problems that I get to solve because, you know, at Cornette, we have, you know, the University of Kentucky, both the academic side and University of Kentucky healthcare. We also have, you know, the alcohol, wine and spirits. I work with the Sazerac family of bourbons from Buffalo Trace Distillery. So I get to work in the spirits business. We work with Caneland Thoroughbred Racecourse. We work with the local CVB in Lexington, uh, Kentucky on Visit Lex stuff. So uh, A&W restaurants, like I get to work in a bunch of different verticals that kind of keeps me thinking 
um, and, and keeps my thinking broad instead mm -hmm. of confined to one vertical or one space. And that just, you know, makes me happier creatively. So I like where I am uh, right now and probably will continue to be on the agency side. I don't think I'm ever going to go into business for myself anymore. Cause like I said, man, I, I don't, I don't like to run the business. I like to create stuff. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like you figured out what works for you and you get to keep it fun. So that's great. Took me um, forever, but I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned, you know, along the way you've written the three books, tell us about the most recent book, Windfluence and the original inspiration behind it. Yeah. So, you know, kind of touching on something that we talked about earlier, I was really frustrated with, you know, uh, and, and fake famous, the documentary hadn't come out yet. So it actually came out like the week before my book launched, which was super great timing for me because I had something to talk about and talk about the book. But I was really frustrated over the course of the last few years of the mainstream media's portrayal of influencers because influencer has kind of become a bad word. Um, and largely because I think the mainstream media, when they do report about influencers, they report the bad seed stories, you know, the ones who are photoshopping clouds into their pictures or, um, you know, doing something really stupid, um, as opposed to focusing on the, you know, the 80% or 85% of the content creators out there who are fantastic at creating great content, engaging their audiences, um, and partnering with brands, you know, for successful campaigns. The mainstream media doesn't like those headlines because that's not a rubbernecking headline. It doesn't make you stop and turn and go, oh, look at this disaster I get to stare at for a few minutes. So that combined with the fact that we were creating some really interesting, I think, innovative influence programs at Cornette. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. And one in particular, we did a campaign for UK healthcare where I we approached it as we want to influence this audience, but we are a local business, a regional business in and around Lexington, Kentucky. Somebody who has 300,000 Instagram followers isn't going to do us any good because less than 5% of them are going to be in Lexington, right? So we want to use influencers, but we want to use people who actually have influence on the audience we're trying to reach. And that made us rethink things. So we started thinking instead of influencers, let's think of influence. And taking the R off is just a slight little semantic thing, but it makes you think about it differently. It's like, okay, who influences the people in Lexington, Kentucky? The music director at the biggest church in town, a local dentist, a local real estate agent, the mayor, the, the CEO of the Urban League. None of these people have big Instagram or, or YouTube you know, followers or subscribers. So it made me sort of rethink influencer marketing and say, well, what if we pull back and looked at it through the lens of influence rather than influencers, we can do smarter things. And the combination of the mainstream media portrayal of influencers and this solution of, well, let's take the R off the damn word so we can think differently about it. And the book kind of blossomed from that. Amazing. Yeah, I think that's such a good way to think about it. At the end of the day, it starts with the audience, right? Where are they spending time? Who are the people or the resources that they already look to? And then how can you take that and incorporate the message to deliver something impactful to those people, right? When you align those things, that's when amazing things happen. Exactly. And, and we've, we've, you know, now when I approach an influence strategy for a client, I start with how can we influence this audience, not what influencers can we use to influence this audience. And again, that just opens the door so much wider for us to develop strategies that actually have influential impact as opposed to, you know, which Instagrammers and YouTubers are we going to use to talk about our product this week? Exactly. So Jason, you know, you've been in the social media space for 15 plus years now, and we've seen how much it's evolved since that time looks totally different today. <laughs> What are some of the biggest changes that you've observed from the early days to, to now? Wow. You know, there's, there's so many, um, you know, it, what's really funny is it seemed like every year, all the trends people were saying, this is going to be the year of mobile. And this is going to be the year of video. Every year is the mobile year of mobile video. <laughs> so there's some consistencies, but I, I, the, the biggest change for fundamentally for me that frustrates me because it takes away from, I think something I'm good at is blogs have become less important and this sort of snackable short content has become more important. And I don't care for that much because A, I'm a writer and I like to write longer form substantive stuff, but it's what consumers are doing. You know, Instagram stories and TikTok and whatnot are there because the attention span of the consumer has evaporated and, and they're, you know, thumb scrolling their way through life now, <laughs> as opposed to taking a moment to sit down and actually consume some content. Um, video is becoming more and more important, but thankfully the technology is, is keeping up with us now, or at least providing better access, um, and abilities because I mean, you know, now every Tuesday morning for, for Cornette, 
I go on live and do a show called Digging Deeper and I interview someone from around the world live where everybody on multiple networks, I do it on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter um, can watch. And so the technology allows us to do really magical things these days. Um, and so we knew that that was you know, going to happen in 2005 or 2006. It was just a matter of how fast it was going to happen. Um, I think the iPhone changed the game, you know, that, that basically not only made everybody a creator, but made everybody capable of creating high quality content with a, you know, a camera and all that kind of stuff. And so it's really just been kind of riding that technology wave and adapting to consumer uh, behavior. But that's really what you do at an agency or what you do in marketing is what are consumers consuming? Where are they consuming it? And how can we be a part of that? So staying kind of ahead of that trend and understanding that, okay, we're, blogs are not as important. They're still important, but they're not as important. Stackable content videos are more important now. So how do we shift and be creative there as opposed to what we were doing 10 years ago? And, um, you know, keeps, keeps things happening, keeps things lively. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, do you think that what originally occupied the blog space has just moved into other platforms? Like, for instance, we've seen the rise of Substack, right, in these individual newsletters. Now we've got an explosion of podcasts and audio content is, you know, if, if I were starting 15 years ago, maybe my only opportunity to express those thoughts would have been a blog. Do you feel like today, now there are so many other formats that just that content is, is going in other directions? I think to a degree it is. I still think blogs, you know, for certain verticals and for certain audiences are highly relevant in the B2B space. You know, people want to spend some time understanding, especially for larger purchases. They want to understand the software or the hardware or the system that you're selling. And so blogs are, are more important in, in that space than they are maybe in consumer product goods. Um, but in the more consumer focused stuff, it's that, you know, things are instead of writing a blog, now people are doing a video or they're doing a podcast or they're yep. doing a live stream or they're doing a live stream, which they repurpose as a recorded video and a podcast and transcribe it to be a blog. Right. Yep. So the technology, again, allows you to diversify and, and repurpose the content you're doing. So I think in, in a lot of cases, you're right that that the content is shifting into other channels. Um, but I still, and I do think that there's a little bit of a red flag, I think, that's waving for me on how much of our content as brands are we, you know, basically leasing out on someone else's space, are we leasing space for on someone else's property? Because I've told people before, I've said this since 2008, you can go build your Facebook page all you want, but tomorrow Mark Zuckerberg can say, you know what, that's $1,000 a day. Or, or you can't be. And he did famously, right? You look at the organic reach of posts over time on Facebook and it, it drops sharp, sharply every year. It's increasingly yep. more pay to play. Instagram now seems to be following that same playbook compared to emerging platforms like TikTok and other places where there's huge organic reach because what's important for them right now, right? Getting people yep. to spend time on the platform, getting you those really high vanity metrics of views, engagements, <laughs> impressions, so that you come back and watch more content. Then ultimately they start pulling those levers and encourage advertisers to spend more. That's how these aggregator platforms and social media exist, right? Those are the business imperatives and the economic incentives that drive that behavior. That's true. And, and, and I worry for brands that we are uh, ignoring our websites and our blogs and, and our own content channels uh, and, and giving all of our, our value, our IP, our property over to these social networks, which can do whatever the hell they want with them. Um, and we don't really have much you know, recourse for that. The one thing I will say about TikTok that's different though, TikTok has figured out the algorithm game better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because when you log into TikTok, you don't see content from your uh, people you follow. Mm -hmm. You see the content TikTok wants you to see. And so they are, you know, basically force feeding you stuff that they've tested and know is really engaging and really addictive and really makes you want to engage with the platform. So they've taken that algorithm game to a new level. Um, and that's why they're so powerful and so popular right now, because even as someone who I, I cannot stand making snackable content stories because I have fat thumbs and I don't like creating on a phone but I will go to TikTok and won't take my eyes off of it for 30 minutes because it's just addictive. They, they figured out how to do that. There's some good in that. There's some bad in that. Um, but they definitely have captured their audience's attention, which makes it a pretty powerful and relevant platform for brands. Big time. Jason, as a parent, what are the things that you're most excited about for the digital world that your son is growing up in? Oh my God. 
what am I excited about? I'm excited that it's at some point he'll be 18 and off the payroll. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, I, you know, my son is a, and daughter, both uh, my son's 16, my daughter's 13. My son is a creator. He's a, uh, you know, a hip hop, you know, writer, artist, mm -hmm. uh, lyricist. Um, and he's produced a couple of his own songs. And the fact that, you know, he can do that with, you know, uh, garage band and, and SoundCloud and, you know, somebody that he met on the internet making mixtapes for him or beats for him is amazing to me that his creativity can be fostered and unlocked. And, and I don't have any idea how to do any of that, but he has figured it out. It's magic. My daughter is a young adult book reviewer on YouTube mm -hmm. and she was in that stage, 10, 11, 12 years old. She was getting into adolescence and, you know, those are always awkward years, especially for girls, I think. And when she started creating this content on YouTube and connected with a couple of people, probably her best friend in the world now is a fellow YA book reviewer on YouTube. Wow, cool. It just kind of unlocked her personality. And she just kind of became, uh, you know, this, you know, wonderfully put together young woman mentally and emotionally because she had this outlet for her creativity. So I'm really thankful that the tools exist for my kids to be able to empower themselves to do really cool things. However, on the same note, I'm scared to death. That I was going to ask you, going, what are the things you worry about? Yeah, yeah they're going to use the technology wrong or some, you know, online predator is going to, you know, leverage their channels to get to them or something like that. But those fears, I think, are sort of set aside for me because we constantly have conversations about the dangers and the precautions that they need to take. I've never been a fear monger for my kids. I've always just said, look, stranger danger happens online and offline. And so we have to understand what that looks like. Um, and when my daughter met this other book, you know, reviewing YouTuber, uh, some little girl from Massachusetts, you know, we were like, well, I need parents' names and phone numbers. And yep. I, I need to know who this person is or, uh -huh. or this is not a cool thing. Yep. And so, and, and my daughter was perfectly, she's like, yeah, oh, I know. Here's, here's her mom and dad's name. Here's the phone number. Here's the email Great. address. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, there, there are some concerns out there, but I think that open line of communications with your kids is, is really powerful. And so far, you know, knock on wood, nothing bad's happened to mine. There we go. That's what it's all about, right? That media literacy, because we're growing up in uncharted waters, right? We have to figure this all out together and, and we're writing the rules as we go. So having that open dialogue and trusting, you know, your kids, I don't have kids yet, but I, I would anticipate that's the, that's the, the secret to success is you have to be very open and say, you know, hey, you have to use your head when you're thinking about how you engage with people and content online. Yep, that's very true. Yeah, the having a good open dialogue with your children is always a good idea. Now, whether or not they listen to you or believe you is a whole different <laughs> ball game. That's but, right. And I've learned that when they hit their teen years, they don't listen to anything you say. But, yep. And they don't want to talk to you either, but that's okay. <laughs> What's coming next? If you had to make three predictions about the future of the digital media space, what would they be? Well, I think obviously I spend a lot of my time working in and thinking about influence marketing. And I think influence marketing is in uh, its infancy still. I think there's a lot of maturation to, to be had, uh, not only with the technology and tools that are out there and making it uh, easier and more efficient for brands of all sizes, because there's not a whole lot of solutions out there for small businesses right now in the space. But I think brands of all sizes are going to have an easier time being able to identify the right paths to influence through the online space in the online world. So I see that as, as being a, a maturation process. Um, I think that um, we're going to start to see um, the implications of TikTok having figured out that algorithm impact. I think we're going to start to see that change uh, a little bit of the algorithm impact of the Facebooks and uh, the Instagrams. I think we're going to be force fed more content that has been tested and proven to appeal to people because they, they built a better mousetrap. So everybody else is going to copycat that. Um, so be prepared for changes in your Instagram and, and Facebook algorithms in the years to come. And then I think we're going to start to see, this is one thing that I, I'm anxious to see. Obviously, social media has opened the door for everybody to be a publisher. I really think we're going to hit a point here in the next probably three to five years where a collective conscious sort of says, okay, not everybody needs to be a publisher. I think everybody's running and saying, Here, this is a land grab for, can I build influence? Can I be famous? Can I have, you know, something on the internet that I'm known for? And I think at some point we're going to see a little bit of a return, an ebb and flow uh, where 
a, a group of people, and maybe it's the next generation that comes to the forefront or something, there's going to be a population that says, you know what, I'm just going to consume. I don't need to be the person doing videos and all that kind of stuff. That's for other people. I like just sitting back and watching. So I am advocating for more introverts. How about that? I like it. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of all those predictions, starting with, you know, we're still in early innings for all of influencer marketing. It, it makes me laugh when people say, oh, well, YouTube doesn't matter anymore. You know, everything's on Instagram or you, Instagram doesn't matter anymore. It's all about TikTok, right? The hot new thing or Clubhouse, yeah. right? And, and you, you look back and you say, well, you know, television is what, 60, 70 years old and radio is 100 years old. And we're constantly reinventing these things, but they have, you know, this massive life, right? They have this long-term yeah. growth horizon and while we may have seen, you know, the early growth period, there's still a lot of opportunity left in these platforms. Um, Absolutely. And then, and then also your comment on, you know, hey, the algorithms are here to stay. I think you're right. Like we're, we're right in the midst of the short form video war, right? YouTube has launched shorts here in the US this month after beta testing in India for, for six months, um, going head to head with TikTok. Obviously Reels on Instagram is getting a lot of attention because Instagram is prioritizing it so heavily in the algorithm. So this format is working, audiences like it, creators are a fan of it. Um, and we've seen that, you know, by taking our legacy mindsets and adapting them to online mediums, that's 1.0, but the 2.0 models are going to reinvent things starting with the internet as the framework. So as an example, right, you know, Instagram and YouTube start off as very search dependent. It's, it's traditional to our browsing history. It's uh, the way we'd think of organizing information on a computer. Whereas TikTok just says, I'm going to serve you up a video based on, you know, your past browsing activity. You can still search, you can still go over here and see the people you follow, but we're going to just make it even easier and remove that extra barrier because we know what you like and we're going to serve it up right to you. Yeah. I, it's, I really and truly feel like when we look back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, that the launch and, and popularity of TikTok and that algorithm is going to be a, a sort of a watershed moment in how the internet works from now on, because it's a very different approach than Google. It's a different approach than Facebook, Twitter, or any of the other platforms. And I think, you know, basically a tool that now says, we're going to feed you what we know you're going to like and having the user not respond with, you know, damn you trying to force feed me stuff uh, but, uh, you know, as opposed to that, responding with, okay, feed me, you know, feed me, see more, bring it, you know, yep. uh, that's what TikTok users do. And I think we're going to start to see more of that from other platforms. Yeah, I think um, a, a space that's particularly ripe for that is music, right? So if you think about mm -hmm. Apple Music, Spotify, we still organize everything based on artists, based on albums, right? Which is this holdover from, you know, physical tapes and then <laughs> CDs and then, you know, records. It's like, why don't we organize the music based on the time of day or the activity, right? So I listen to different music when I'm at the gym working out than when I'm relaxing at home in the evening versus, you know, on the weekends. So how can the, the applications get smarter and say, oh, we're going to serve you up new music based on your mood or based on the activity, right? So I think we're going to see this application of the algorithmic uh, recommendations applied in all of our entertainment, uh, you know, uh, areas in the future. Well, and then if you take into account, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the internet of things and the smart web out there, you can actually build a life where depending upon what you just asked your, you know, voice assistant, or depending upon, you know, what, you know, item just came out of your refrigerator or what you just cooked in your stove or who's standing on your front porch with your ring. Now, all of a sudden, your content can change based on what's going on in your life. You can and, and you've got a, you know, a watch that's measuring all your health stuff. So I could literally get up in the morning and say, you know, hey, Siri, play me some music and it'll play me music to lift my mood and my spirit because it knows my serotonin levels are a certain, you know, yep. place. So, I mean, there's so much craziness that can happen with all this. There's nowhere to go, but, but up, it's a little scary, a little big brothery, but at the same time, um, you know, I think if, if we constantly monitor and watch some limitations in place so that brands and marketers don't get to control everything, but it's sort of the natural extension of leveraging the technology in a good way, I think we've got nowhere to go but up in terms of having a really connected and uh, interesting experience as consumers. Yeah. And those debates are playing out right before our, our eyes, right? You have um, Google saying, hey, you know, we're getting rid of cookie data and, and obviously Apple making a big push on the privacy front. Um, whether or not you think this is well-intentioned and, you know, they're trying to lead into the future, or if you're more of the maybe uh, skeptic like myself, where it's 
okay, it's a strategy credit. Obviously, Apple is incentivized to continue to focus on its closed ecosystem. And for Google, you know, they're pushing this cohort model because they already control so much of the connected web that it'll be hard for anyone else to gather the same level of first party data that they can collect. What do you predict for the future of privacy and the user's level of comfort sharing that type of information online? You know, every time a story comes out, my, my mind goes to we're that much closer to having ultimate consumer control, um, whether it's regulatory or whether it's, you know, the apples of the world or even the, you know, phone and, and data providers of the world saying, hey, consumer, you get to control this. It's no longer in Mark Zuckerberg's hands. You can turn on or off advertisements and all sorts of other things that your apps and your phones and the things that you're connected to can do. Every time another story comes out, more consumers grow concerned about, you know, how invasive uh, these platforms, uh, these advertisements and these applications are. And so I think we're going to reach a point where maybe the government has to step in. Maybe it's a regulatory thing. I think what Apple's trying to do is say it doesn't need to be a regulatory thing. We can regulate ourselves. So let's be responsible and do that. But, uh, but really, nobody has built an easy mechanism for consumers to A, understand and B, control the information and the data that they're presented every day. And I think that's only going to get better. Yeah, let's hope so. Jason, one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who comes on the podcast, given so many other entrepreneurs tune in and listen, and obviously, you know, you've, you've shared your experience and relationship with entrepreneurship, but I, I like to think about what's the white space out there, right? If you were going to go out and start a business in the digital media space today, knowing everything you know, and kind of seeing what opportunities are out there, what would you do? Well, you know, oh man, that's a really good question because I, I tried doing something a few years ago. I think I might have been a little ahead of my time or it may have been a dumb idea, one of the two. Um, I don't know which one, but um, I tried to start a, a research company, a market research company based on social listening data. So instead of just, you know, keyword searching and finding people mentioning your brand, actually diving to and analyzing conversations around topics and around industries and around brands to really better inform them. So instead of going out and doing a, you know, commissioning a $75,000 survey at the end of the year to know what consumers think of you, you can actually, you know, use technology that's available to see what people are saying about you online and extract some valuable information, maybe not everything, but some valuable information out of that. And I think there are, you know, some social listening platforms out there that are, that are doing that in interesting ways. But that was the white space that I saw a few years ago and tried to fill it, but I, A, didn't have the capital and B, didn't have uh, probably the business acumen to pull it all together myself. Um, but I think also, too, there's so much opportunity for improvement in organizing the, uh, the media that we use today in terms of podcasts and live streams and videos. It's not just enough, I think, to have a YouTube where you can go search. Um, there's one uh, app right now that I'm using uh, for podcasts called Podchaser, and I love that it's kind of like a flipboard for podcasts. I can go there, and I don't have to download 25,000 podcasts to my phone. I can flip through and just follow a stream, and every time a podcast updates, I see it, and I go, oh, look, you know, the James Altucher thing's out. I can click on that and listen to that now. I don't have to clutter my phone with it. So I think there's a lot of improvement space out there for how we consume media and how we organize it, and so I would probably lean in that direction if I were starting something new. Awesome. Very cool. Jason, where can people find out more about you, the work you do at Cornet, your book, your podcast, all the other great resources? Sure. So the easiest place to start is jasonfalls.com. That's got links to everything, podcast, book, et cetera. Uh, Cornet is actually at team Cornet, T-E-A-M Cornet.com. And uh, we do really great creative work. I'm one of a, a team of about 50, 55 people there. And we do really good work for folks and come check those case studies out. Um, um, and then uh, you can go to winfluencebook.com to get to the landing page on my website there where you can click to order the book wherever you want to. Um, and uh, there might even be a discount code on the entrepreneur press link. So you can go there and click and get a little bit of a discount, but hey, look at it's that. available. Yeah. It's available at all your bookstores and Amazon and Barnes Noble and all that good stuff too. Fantastic. Well, Jason, this has been such a blast. Thank you for what you do and all the amazing things that you share. I highly recommend and encourage everyone to, to check it out and, and encourage uh, you know, them to read up and listen more to extend their knowledge. But thank you so much for taking the time to share your journey and your experience here today. James, thank you. And thanks to all the people out there in the audience listening. I hope this has been helpful for you. Thanks for tuning in. I'm James Creech, and this has been another edition of All Things Video. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll share and subscribe for new episodes. See you next time.